The third lesson today comes from Psalm 85, a strange place to preach from. Um, And I was so tempted to do all of that Isaiah passage we use for our call to worship, which fits very nicely with this psalm. But we'll be in Psalm 85 today. You can find that on page 588 if you'd like to read along while I read. Listen for the word of the Lord. You, O Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him. And prepares the way for his steps. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So one of my favorite writers uh, had a teenage son. At the time that she and her son went on the trip I'm about to tell you about, uh, it was just the two of them. She was a single mother, and they went on a ski trip for several days. But he was a teenage boy, and he was into snowboarding. So the way that their joint ski trip went was that they would get there, he would grab a snowboard, he would find boys his own age, and he would be gone for the rest of the day. She was not a great skier, not particularly experienced, and so she started out each ski trip getting on a pretty gentle slope, sliding down, not necessarily intentionally, towards the bottom, often ending up in the net that's supposed to catch the little kids from getting in trouble, flailing around in the net for a while, so thankful that her son, teenage son, was not there to see her, and then she'd get out of the net, and after that, things would generally go better. Except every so often, she'd be standing on her skis and would just fall over for no reason, happened to her a lot. Well, again, she's the parent of a teenager, and as now the parent of a teenager, I can tell you, we start to forget things. Um, Not everything is as clear and sharp and ready at hand as it once was, Um, and that happens to everybody, including teenagers. It's going to happen to you, too. Well, here's the problem. So this woman takes the ski lift up, and she's on her chair, and she's going up the mountain, and she knows the slope she's looking for, this intermediate slope. She's already skied that day. It's the sort of chairlift that goes up for a while slows down. There's a little place where you can get off for this slope, or it'll keep taking you up the mountain. Slows down. She looks around and doesn't recognize anything. I mean, it's all snow and people in colorful ski jackets and all that. So she decides, oh, not my stop. I'm the next one. Chairlift picks up again, starts getting higher, and then she realizes, nope, that is where I want to go. And if I go higher, it's going to be a harder slope, and I may just die coming down. So she does what any sensible parent of a teenager at high elevation and low oxygen would do. She wriggles to the front of the seat and she throws herself off, thinking it's going to be kind of like a stuntman, kind of like a, I don't know, some of the skiers you see in the Olympics now doing things skiers didn't used to do, jumping here, jumping there. She miraculously lands on her skis temporarily, and then she falls over very hard. Well, she was brought up by a mother and at a time where you, even when you were terribly embarrassed, you didn't want to cause any other people any, other, any discomfort. So people come up to her, are you okay? And oh, no, I'm waving, fine, I'm fine, just need to catch my breath, thank you, no, fine, politely smiling. And these two young women skied up, they made the right sympathetic noises, but I'm fine, let me just catch my breath, they ski on their way. She catches her breath and realizes, I am not fine. Something is terribly, terribly wrong. She is hurt. She is nauseated. She gets on her skis, and now she's dizzy. She thinks she's going to be sick, and now she can't decide if she wants somebody to come help or if she just hopes everybody will go away on the mountain. Where will her help come from in the midst of this situation? She writes the most amazing thing about this, although it made me really nervous at first. Here's what she says. All I knew was that help is always on the way 100% of the time. All I knew was that help is always on the way 100% of the time. And that made me nervous because what if help doesn't come and it's on the way? But she goes on to say this. I know that when I call out, God will be near and hear and help eventually. 
Of course, it is the eventually that throws one into despair. I know that God is near, will hear, and will help eventually. And the eventually throws one into despair. God always hears our cries. God always helps. It's often a surprise to see what form God will take on earth, what sort of help God will bring. Well, she's standing there, gets over her dizziness and nausea, oh, just a little bit, and wondering, is it going to be these two pretty young women going to ski back to check on her? No. Is it going to be a tall, handsome, rugged skier, perhaps? No such luck. Uh, But an older, smaller woman with the ski patrol does come up and check on her, puts her in a shed, gives her hot chocolate, gives her time uh, to get back to herself, and she does. Surprising to see what forms of help God will provide here on earth. Uh, she tells another story. I've told a version of it. I've told you the story about the guy in the flood, and the flood waters keep rising. He's told to evacuate, and he doesn't. Well, she tells a different sort of story, same idea. This man has been on a horrible adventure, a misadventure, also a snowy adventure, by the way. He's lost in the wilderness, and it's very snowy, and he's cold, and he doesn't know where he is and doesn't know how to get out, and he's sure he is going to die out there in the cold and the snow in the wilderness. Well, he's able to tell this story because he makes it back, miraculously, but he's at a bar pouring out his sorrows to the bartender as the bartender pours out things for him. And he basically is talking about this crisis of faith he had. Because here's the thing. He's lost in the wilderness. It's cold. It's snowy. He's sure he's going to die. And he cries out to God for help. And nothing, nothing. God forsook him in the wilderness. God never answered his prayer. And he said, if it hadn't been for those bunch of Eskimos that came by, I would have frozen out there. (laughs) Where was God that day? Crying out to God, boy, if it hadn't been for the Eskimos, God really let me down that day. It's surprising to see what form God will take on earth when God comes to help, when God comes to save. But it's that eventually that's the killer for all of us. Can we hang on to the truth that God is near, God does hear, God will help when that eventually comes along and we're waiting and waiting? And this is the call for all God's people pretty much throughout all time. Will God help? When is eventually going to be over? How do we deal with the eventually? From the very beginning, sin and death enter into the world, and Adam and Eve wonder if things are ever going to be made right again. They knew a perfect paradise, and now it was completely wrecked. Wondering, is God going to help? Does God hear? Will he help? When is eventually going to be over? The people of God are wandering through the wilderness. They've made it out of captivity in Egypt. That's fantastic. But here we are in the desert, and we're going to a promised land, but we're not there yet. Is God near? Does God hear? Is God really going to help eventually? Well, for them, it was 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, but they came into the promised land. People are there for a long time, but then they get conquered and people are sent into exile far, far away. That's exactly what this psalmist is talking about, by the way. He remembers what it was like when the people of God were in a far off land where they didn't speak the language and didn't worship those gods. And they didn't know if God would ever hear, would God ever be near, would God ever help? That's the way the psalm begins. God, remember what happened before. You showed your favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of your people. You forgave their sins. You brought them back. Are you going to do that again like you did before? Is God near? Does God hear? Will God help? God, help is on the way, always on the way, 100% of the time. It's that eventually that's the hard thing. Restore us again, O God, our Savior. It's the call of Advent too, by the way to trust that God is near, God hears, and God will help no matter where we find ourselves. Advent promises a lot of things, and some things we don't always see in this life and in this world. Advent promises things among them being peace. That's what's on the front of your bulletin today. And we proclaim the Prince of Peace has come into this world. And that is true. And it is true even if I can pick up a newspaper and the headlines do not tell me about peace coming into this world. Or if I listen to the radio news, I find out that there are all kinds of things going on. And if I watch CNN, which is really helpful and really hurtful all at the same time, but that's another sermon about 24-hour news cycle, big problem. But it does not look like peace has come. Restore us again, O God. Will you not revive us again? Show us your unfailing love that we may rejoice in you. Grant us your salvation. The people of God waiting to see, does God hear me? Is God close to me? Is God far off? Is God going to help? 
But help is always on the way, is always on the way. Well, about 500 years ago or so, not quite, John Calvin was writing about this psalm and about this situation. And he's saying, here's the thing. The psalmist is saying that no matter what things look like, no matter how bad things get, no matter how dark things seem to be, no matter what kind of trouble we find ourselves in, contrary to all outward appearances, God is not far off from his people and deliverance, rescue, is near at hand. My writer, not friend, I'm going to get to hear her in April, I hope, but, and maybe, maybe even meet her, but this writer that I like so much is in the snow, feeling horrible, and is deliverance near at hand? Not the way she expected. Guys lost in the wilderness, praying for salvation. Deliverance was near at hand. It just didn't look much like it. This happens to us all the time. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, whether it's somebody we care about who is waiting for news and we're afraid it's going to be bad, they actually get bad news. Then they go on and people are sick and people are struggling and people are discouraged and people are hurting. And sometimes those people are us, which is bad grammar, but the best way to put it. When we find ourselves feeling that God must be far off, that everything is falling apart, that this can't possibly be the way the world is supposed to be, which is the right response, by the way. You're never supposed to think, oh, when things are going badly, this is the right way. It's always the wrong way. It means that something is very, very wrong with our world. Is God going to hear? Is God going to be near? Is God going to help? And even when it seems for all outward appearances that God is far off, yet his deliverance is near at hand. Calvin goes on to say, even when the divine help seems slowest in coming, which is why Paul read that passage from 2 Peter, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, though it feels slow to us sometimes. And it's not just because a year is like a thousand, wait, a, thou, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. It's not that God's schedule's right and yours is wrong. And so if you only would catch up with his calendar, you'd be all right. It is that this is where we find ourselves. Things are not right. I am worried, I am scared, I am hurt, or somebody dear to me is. There are wars and rumors of wars and there are disasters all over and whatever is going to become of us. And in that moment of feeling like God is just not showing up, that's the time we have to grab onto this truth. He is close and he is on the way. Help is always on the way 100% of the time. God always helps eventually. The eventually is what Advent's about. The eventually is the people waiting all this time. Not only were they in exile, but now they're back to the promised land, which doesn't look so promising. And for hundreds of years before Jesus is born, things don't really look that good. One empire after another continues to conquer the people of God. We had already gone through the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians show up. Now we've got the Greeks and finally the Romans. And it just seems like superpower after superpower is tramping down God's people underfoot. And will God ever do anything? God has made some promises. Verse 8, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people. And not 2,000 years ago and not today is there peace in this world. And the people of God were crying out for God to keep his promises. And they're waiting. And eventually, or as Luke put it, at exactly the right time, God shows up. He promises peace to his people. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, fear him, worship him, revere him, not scared of him necessarily, that his glory may dwell in our land. Let me take back the scared part. When God's glory shows up, even in the tiniest portion, it scares people to death. That's the whole scene of the shepherds on the hillside, by the way, right? It's dark. It's night. It's Christmas Eve. They don't know that. They don't know it's a big deal yet. They just think they're out with the sheep. And suddenly one angel shows up. One angel is enough to put them on their faces in the grass. Terrifying. Not because it's unexpected. Not because it's an angel. Well, probably that. The glory of God comes down and they're scared to death. Sore afraid, right? And then it's not just one angel, but a multitude of the heavenly hosts show up. And that's really pretty terrifying. But God's salvation was near at hand and God was coming down from heaven to earth to be laid in a manger wonder of wonders. And this is part of the eventually of Advent. Will there be peace worldwide? Will there be peace in a community? Will there be peace in a house? Will there be peace in a heart? Will there be deliverance from disease, from death, from grief, from despair? Surely his salvation is near those who fear him. 
that is glory. Terrifying, but also un, uh, I'm flabbergasted is the word I heard yesterday. Um, undone by the glory of God. This incredible presence of God. And this is the thing that caught my attention by, by this psalm, by the way. It's not just this light suddenly shining in a dark space. It's not like a spotlight from heaven comes down and then suddenly everything's lit up. The psalmist idea is not that God's going to shine light over here and then he's going to withdraw it and go do something else. The psalmist idea is that the whole glory of God is going to come down and dwell in our land. I think of dwelling as a, it's a heavy word. It's a settling in word. Glory come down and it's here. And when you dwell someplace, you stay there. It's not a temporary thing. That so caught my attention. In Isaiah, um, the end of our call to worship, we talked about the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. Not just the shepherds on the hillside and not just uh, the magi as they come in with their gifts and not just the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus is an adult and the glory of the Lord shines and a few people see it and also end up on their faces, by the way. But that his glory may come and dwell in our land. God with us. Emmanuel. Yes, Jesus ascends into heaven, certainly, and he is there, and he's not just twiddling his thumbs, and he's not busy doing other things. He is busy with the work of the kingdom of God coming on this earth, person by person, heart by heart, all over this world. He's busy doing that, but he's also left us his spirit, a very important gift, he tells his disciples, so that not only his glory may dwell in our land, but also his presence may stay with us so that he can be Emmanuel God with us. The tricky thing about Advent and the tricky thing about living in this time in between times, Christ has come, Christ is coming again, and here we are stuck in this middle that doesn't seem very fun a lot of the time. I don't particularly like to watch the news on TV because I don't like what I learn. I don't particularly like to read the headlines, though I do every single day, and that's not necessarily good for me, but I am caught up, or at least I like to give the impression of being caught up. I do not see peace. I do not see solution. I don't see much salvation or deliverance when I look around the world that way. But I am convinced that God indeed will give what is good and does give what is good. That's verse 12. I am convinced that help is always on the way 100% of the time and that God is near and that God hears and that God will help. Surely his salvation is near to his people. He will show us his love. He will grant us his salvation. He will give what is good. Because though we're in between times and things look pretty scary and pretty sad some of the time, God is not leaving us alone. He is not far off. He has not forgotten us. He will give what is good. He will dwell in our land. He will, better than that, dwell in our hearts. Incredible promise of Jesus Just ask, he says, and the Father and I will come and make our home in your heart. He has come. He is coming. He comes right now as well. That's the promise of Advent, that God has not forgotten us. God is not waiting for some time to do something, but God is at work even now to give what is good, to deliver his people, to be near and to hear and to help. Sometimes eventually, sometimes right away. But you can be sure of it. God will indeed give what is good. Will you please join me in prayer? Easy for me to say, Lord, that you can be sure of it. We're not always sure. I'm not always sure of it. There are times that you feel very far off. And I pray that by your spirit and by your grace, you would help us to know that you are near. And particularly when we feel like giving up. We feel like there's no way you can get us out of this snowbank or out of this wilderness. Help us to know that your deliverance is indeed near at hand. And your help comes always. It's on the way. We thank you for Advent. We remember that Christ is on his way. He is coming again with power and glory. And he will make all things new and set all wrong things right. Every tear will be wiped away. Every disease healed. Every broken heart mended. Every life lost will be found. For that, we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.